So I thought rather than focus just on uh, what had happened in the Indigenous sphere in the last 21 years, I might think of this as a um, something of a personal, my own personal journey through the last 21 years, perhaps thinking about where I was 21 years ago and maybe where I might be in 21 years' time. Um, in 1994, I was finishing off my PhD at the University of Melbourne. Um, it was a life-changing experience without any doubt. I was working in the area of history. Uh, I was a single mother with two small children and I'd come from a, actually <laughs> from a health background, um, which I'd decided very cavalierly to throw in the towel and uh, go back to university and retrain. 1992, just 18 months earlier, um, Paul Keating had delivered the Redfern speech. What was at the time the most extraordinary, um, riveting, and when we revisited it a couple of years back when it was the 20th anniversary, deeply moving, profoundly important speech. A speech that truly at the time felt we were on the threshold of something great, something extraordinary. Of course, a year later, we had the Mabo Act. Um, the decision was, of course, in 1992, we had the Native Title Act in 1993. And again, these felt like the times were really happening. Things were exciting. On a personal level, in 1994, my Aboriginal grandmother died. My Aboriginal grandmother had kept a lot of her secrets to herself. And like a lot of Aboriginal women from her generation, she felt that it was important to survive and her survival in a lot of ways depended on her silence. So she was not very forthcoming in telling me much about our Aboriginal heritage. So there was a very strange experience for me, quite a cathartic moment when this very important person died, one of the most important people in my life. And yet it also released me and gave me the freedom to start doing the research into our Aboriginal family, which I'd been fairly clearly told I wasn't to do while she was alive. So there was that freedom. Um, it was also a slightly guilty feeling, as you might imagine, because I knew I was probably doing what she'd prefer I didn't do. I'd come through a schooling system um, where almost the entire schooling, my high school, entire school was non-English speaking background. Um, grew up in a suburb where most of the people were um, second generation, uh, sorry, first generation um, the kids I went to school with, second generation migrants. So it sent me on a journey to, to engage with the Aboriginal community here in Victoria and particularly here in Melbourne and important people like Aunty Iris Lovett Gardner, Uncle Jack Kennedy from Western Victoria, Aunty Joy Murphy Wandon and Aunty Carolyn Briggs played an incredibly important role in their welcoming way that they actually guided me through that process. Later on, I had the opportunity to work in native title. Again, something that really came out of the early 1990s, something that in the early 1990s we really believed was going to change the face of Australian society. And notwithstanding those terrible headlines that we all saw where they had you know, backyards up for grabs and they showed maps where um, hysterical people were suggesting that you know 70 or 80 percent of the country would be claimed and people would be losing their their swimming pools and tennis courts. Um, notwithstanding that, it was a time when it really felt like we were getting somewhere. There were Aboriginal organisations like the Victorian Aboriginal Health or Contr Controlled Out Health Organisation. There was the Victorian Aboriginal um, Community Services and there was the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care. These were important organisations that really started in the late 80s. I mean, they started earlier than that as a grassroots organisations, but they really took off in those early 90s. So really, in the last 21 years, these were important organisations. As a result of those connections that I was able to build and to work in the area, I've been able to go back to my country to actually experience it, to stand on country, to speak language to country, which is really important. And it's things that I would never have had the opportunity to do if I hadn't actually turned to a number of people who were working in the area, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And for the language skills, I actually had to be taught by non-Indigenous linguists. But these were incredibly important things that have happened over the last 21 years. <laughs> 